All right, hi everyone. So the, the LEC is very excited to welcome, welcome Dr. Laura Walker. So Dr. Laura Walker is a Missouri native and grew up just a few hours north of St. Louis in Hannibal, Missouri. She completed her undergraduate degree in biology from Maryville University. Dr. Walker spent several years in a molecular immunology lab at the medical school before grad school. She then went on to complete her PhD at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. There, Dr. Walker studied the ecology of myxomyces, um, the plasmodial <laughs> so live in Parkinson, <laughs> um, in Panama with the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. And then in 2018, Dr. Walker joined um, Strasburg and Pollard Lab and is currently working on the genomics of cheating and the social amoeba, um, <laughs> Dictostelium. Discordium, the primary topic of this talk, <laughs> um, and then as well as the microbiome of the discordium and evolution of post, post symbiotic relationships. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and thank you, LEC, for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. I've seen so many great LEC talks, and you guys have so much going on. So it's great to be a part of it. Um, uh, I meant to have this up, but time got away from me. I want to show you this shout out for our new stock. Hold, oh, please. Well, I can't go backwards, but I can go forwards. So that's where we're going to go. I was going to share a moment about the um, market fresh science at the Ferguson Farmers Market, if you're interested contact me. Um, okay, so this is a schematic of the eukaryotic tree of life. And when most of us look at this, I think we see maybe a few groups that stick out that we're familiar with, such as plants and the animals, all of the larger, many of the larger multicellular things. So, um, but we often forget about the fact that there's actually multicellular lineages all across this tree. Um, and in fact, um, it's evolved, uh, multicellularity has evolved independently over 20 times um, across the entire tree of life. And as I said, it's present in all of these major lineages, but not all of them arise from a single cell like plants and animals. So we're used to a single cell dividing and um, generating all the cells of a unit of the body or the unit. Um, but you can get multicellular in other ways. And I'm going to talk about um, one interesting example of this aggregative multicellularity in um, one group, the uh, Dictyostelium discordium is our model organism. Uh, they're down here in the amoeba zoa clade. And um, so to tell you about uh, Dictyostelium discoidium, we often call it dicty. So if I give you shorthand, that's on accident, that's what I'm referring to. Um, so these are free living amoebae. They live in the soil and they're predators of bacteria. They serve as a model organism for many different areas of research, such as um, cell cell signaling, chemotaxis, <clears throat> bagocytosis. And in the Strauss-Kahn and Queller lab, we like to study them because of this interesting social cycle and their aggregative multicellularity. So in um, this life cycle, which I'll take you through, um, but we have, instead of arising from a single cell, cells that become the, um, the whole organism is comprised 
by cells that aggregate together using uh, cyclic AMP as a chemoattractant to come together. So um, in this figure, we've got the illustration on top and then a photograph or microscopic image just below. And if we start from the left, we've got the single cell amoebae. So these are independently doing their thing, eating bacteria. But as soon as um, they sense starvation, so they, they sense that the food is running out, they're running out of bacteria, they begin to secrete cyclic AMP and um, aggregate. And so you can see in this video, all of the cells are streaming together to aggregate into one mass, one mound of cells. Um, and this mound of cells will then um, become a slug. And the slug then can travel in search of a good place to form a fruiting structure. And the fruiting structure then is composed of a stalk and a uh, sorus on top full of fertile spores. So multicellularity and fruiting body formation has many advantages. Um, in in Dictyostelium, um, some of these include the fact that the slug can travel much farther and much faster than a single cell amoebae can travel and access new environments. Um, also, just being able to form a spore um, in this fruiting structure allows uh, you to withstand harsh environments. And um, the stalk lifting the spores helps, likely helps with the dispersal of spores to new environments. And we're finding more food. So, um, but the especially fascinating thing about this uh, is that this, the formation of the stalk is an altruistic trait. So at each, each time this happens, um, the fruiting structure, about 20% of the spores are gonna die forming the stalk. Um, so they're sacrificing themselves to aid in raising all the other spores, all the other cells that become spores and aid in dispersal. But why would you sacrifice your own reproductivity for others is the question. Well, when the cells are highly related, the altruistic benefit goes to your relatives. And um, that's what we think is usually, that's what is happening in nature. Most of the time, most of the fruiting bodies in nature are clonal, so um, it works. But it's interesting because the cells that aggregate together don't necessarily have to be related. So if, an, if a non-related cell joins the aggregate, then there's a conflict created. And but this is interesting for us. It makes a great opportunity for research because we can um, mix clones intentionally in the lab and um, see what happens basically. And what we see is that typically when you mix two different clones together, they will um, form a fruiting structure. And one of the two, if there's two clones, one will cheat by producing more spores in the fruiting body than stock. So we call this cheating. And um, if that was allowed to spread, that would destroy multicellularity and cooperation. So we know that when they're rare, uh, they have a selective advantage because they're automatically um, making more spores than the other. But as the cheaters increase in a group, so does the cost for the group. So if we compare clonal to mixed populations or a chimera of multiple genotypes on the bottom, you can see the slug travels, doesn't travel as far and the fruiting structures are going to be wimpier. So um, they often have shorter stalks and spore production can decrease as well. So if this were allowed to spread, we'd lose multicellularity. So what, what maintains this? Well, in a previous study, um, in our lab, Jenny Kozdolfik did a very nice uh, study where she used experimental evolution to show that multicellularity is maintained by the relatedness of the cells. So the way she did this was she used experimental evolution and, um, so, and removed the relatedness, which I'll explain. So by starting, she started with a single clone of the AX4 line and plated 24 replicate lines. And then she evolved those in the lab, transferring 
a million spores from one plate to the next. But at each transfer, she would mix all of the cells very, very well and only transfer a small portion of them, a million. And in that way, it creates a situation where if a, uh, if a mutation arises that confers cheating, then on the next plate, it's likely more likely to be in um, close proximity to cells that it's not related to. So these new mutations arise and they have the ability to spread by cheating and exploiting new partners at every passage. So this, uh, after 30 transfers, she then tested and indeed um, most of the lines had developed cheating. And in, on top of that, um, a lot of the fruiting structures, uh, if, if, excuse me, there were, there were poor fruiting bodies or none at all. So a lot of these clones had lost the ability to cooperate and form a fruiting structure. Um, so that was the case, 18 out of the 24 lines cheated. And um, as I said, many lost the ability to form a fruiting structure. And we can see in this picture on the top, that's just an aerial view looking down on a clone where the cells have just clumped up together and development stops. They can't form a fruiting body anymore. And she also found that as the portion of these non-fruiters increase in the population or in a chimera, uh, spore production rapidly decreases. So the cheating behavior and the non-fruiting behavior are both very detrimental to multicellularity. Um, and, and this figure shows that across the 24 lines, if you see the first one on the far left is the ancestor, and uh, it has, um, so this is the percentage of non-fruiting clones. The ancestor had none, but you can see that across the 24 lines, there's a varying number of, of clones in each population that had lost the ability to fruit up, up as high as 65%. Um, on top of this, if we zero in on these handful that I've marked, that these are the, the few lines that did not cheat, they also tended to have fewer non-fruiting um, clones, is what we call them. So um, this makes sense because if you can't form a fruiting body, the only way you're gonna get to the next transfer is if you cheat. Um, so it makes sense, but it also provides a great opportunity for us to then return to these lines and we can very easily determine if these lines are um, likely to carry the mutations that conferred these um, phenotypes. And so this is where my project picks up. I um, returned to the cell lines that Jenny evolved to do genome sequencing. And I, I did the genome sequencing for all 24 of the lines. And for each of the lines, I picked one of the non-fruiting clones um, with the intention to identify these independent mutations that seem to have arisen in all of these lines. And this was done in collaboration and with um, some support from the McDonald Genome Institute. And so uh, just uh, to run you through the collection of the data um, for the uh, populations. So I re I'm referring to the, each of the lines as a population because in um, each, each line, it still contains some fruiters and some non-fruiters. So at, together, the cheaters can still make it into fruiting structures and survive so we can, so the population contains both. So all we had to do with these is just grow them up from the freezer, get enough cells to isolate DNA. But then to identify the non-fruiters, these can only be identified when they're plated from a single cell, when they're forced to grow from a single cell and have no one to exploit. So these were plated out clonally and individual non-fruiting clones that just failed to fruit. I could collect those, grow more DNA and carry out the sequencing. So um, the analysis part, these first two steps were done in collaboration and with help from Jason Walker at MGI or the McDonald Genome Institute. So we did the whole genome sequencing of all 48 samples that includes the populations, clones, as well as the ancestral line. 
And these were all aligned to the AX4 reference genome. And I included the Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is our food bacterium, um, which I'll show you in just a moment. Um, I had a feeling there was gonna be a lot of this food bacterium that we couldn't get washed away, undigested, et cetera. And it did help a lot. But then in variant calling, I used two different collars to identify SNPs just as a um, uh, extra measure to um, confirm results. So they, I could then only accept a variant if it was called by two different programs and structural variants were called with a separate one. And then the filtration and curation, I have to thank Sindari and Rinchen, two fantastic undergraduate students who were invaluable in this process. So the um, dictyostelium genome is was not fun to work with. Uh, the so it's not too big; it's only thirty-four megabases, but it's actually over seventy-seven percent AT. So, um, and because of this AT bias, there are uh, as a large portion of simple sequence repeats. Both of these things are very problematic for for the uh, sequencing. The alignment and the variant calling. So um, that was fun. Uh, but regardless, it still went pretty well. The alignment went really well, uh, except about half of the reads did belong to the food bacterium, um, which from the AT bias, especially, we, you know, the sequencing then was more prone to pick up the bacterial DNA. So um, but that worked pretty well. We still ended up with a coverage of 127 um, across all of the samples. So that was uh, plenty. Now the fun part. So the details don't matter here. I only show you this because this, this part of just the variant filtration, identifying what these SNPs are, like what mutations have occurred, to get rid of all of the false positives took about a year uh, because um, it's a lengthy process. So we started with, this is just from one call or 53,000 variants to then determine is it real or not real? And there's no, um, no truth sets. So um, it took a lot of trial and error and thanks to my students. So at the end we had about we had 300 from one caller and around the same number from the second caller, which we then manually reviewed. So manually visualized all of the sequence data across all 48 columns to determine like, is that a sequencing bias or is that a you know is that real? Is it in a repeat region? And so that was a very long process, but these guys were awesome. Ultimately, we did get a set of 38 SNPs that we felt confident about, and um, they fell on 29 different genes. All but one of them were non-synonymous mutations. And um, unfortunately, as most of the genome, most of these, or not most of the genome, a, a large proportion of the genome of the reference is still missing annotations. And so it's no surprise that the genes that we pulled out uh, many of them are still lacking annotation. Um, and so we, we didn't find anything enriched, but that could be just because we're missing some annotations. However, um, excuse me, um, one thing of interest is that we thought, well, maybe even though we don't know these genes, maybe they've been reported before. There have been previous studies that people have looked and identified genes that are involved in cooperation, conflict, cheating. So um, we checked and um, our genes are here in, in the purple and there was no overlap. And I think it was a total of almost 600 genes between all of these data sets combined. So I think that just points to the complexity of this process. But the exciting thing frozen, is that we did identify parallel evolution occurring with one gene, this um, GRLG. So we found 10 different non-synonymous SNPs on this one gene. Every other gene had only one. And um, 
On top of that, from the structural variant analysis, I found that GRLG had five structural variants too. So it had four deletions and one inversion, and none of the other genes had any variant, um, excuse me, structural variants. So already pointing very strongly to parallel evolution. And then even more so, these are all independent. So they've all uh, arose independently across all of the lines. Well, the, the green checks are the lines with one of these mutations. So what the heck is it? It's a G protein coupled receptor, which is very exciting. Um, it, this is GPCRs or for short. This is the largest group of uh, receptors of extracellular stimuli um, in eukaryotes. And the human genome alone has over 800. So they can bind hormones, uh, neurotransmitters, metabolites, pheromones, you name it. They're pretty much involved in most physiological processes. So it's no surprise that they're right now they're already the target of around a third of FDA approved drugs that are on the market. And they're still the most um, researched targets for drugs because of their involvement in so many different processes. And the dictyostelium genome has a lot too, over 60. And many of these have actually um, are lineage specific expansions. Um, and a lot of them are still mysterious. But one that is the um, one of the GPCRs is the receptor of cyclic AMP, which, if you remember, I mentioned is the molecule that um, dictyostelium uses to for um, coordinating development and the entire morphogenesis process. So that's very exciting. Uh, the GRL stands for glutamate receptor like because it's. Um, has structural similarity to the um, glutamate and GABA receptors in uh, mammals. So it's a member of the class C, which means that it has this characteristic structure of a really large extracellular binding domain externally, and then the front transmembrane with um, DNA, and the G protein coupled receptor intracellularly, which is where these, um, so that's. Uh, the ligand gets bound on that externally and triggers conformational changes that then trigger the activation of these G proteins or whatever chosen protein is on the intracellular side. Um, so DICT has 17 of these. A lot of them, most of them are still don't have established roles, but actually the ones that do, most of them are in development. So there's, um, so it makes sense that we found what we did, even though we don't know what it does yet. Uh, um, so this is a, we just confirmed with the alpha fold. If you haven't played with this yet, I highly recommend it. Um, the, this alpha fold by um, DeepMind is a AI generated protein prediction, protein folding predictions, and um, you can view your your protein interactively in 3D, which is pretty cool. And so you see, it was it does fold with pretty high confidence, very high confidence, and it does seem to have this characteristic structure that we expect to see of a external binding domain with a little pocket, which we think is the domain and the southern transmembrane domain in the tail. So returning to the variants then, where are they? So this is the um, sequence uh, in the and the squares are highlighting the area, the location of all of the variants that we found, or most of the variants. There's actually two more that were upstream that would truncate the protein. So I mean, looking at it with oh, like all of these are, you know, they're all gonna break the protein, break the um, phenotype and cause non-fruiting. Uh, so, but we needed to confirm. So the next step was we um, went back to the lines again and wanted to identify if we could see a, a direct association between clones that could and could not form a fruiting body and these variants that we had already found. So again, we plated them and identified both fruiting and non-fruiting clones. 
um, in order to sequence with Sanger. So here's just an image showing, um, as I said, we had a, it's, it's pretty easy to tell if they can or cannot fruit. Um, so these are aerial images. I don't, I don't know if you can tell. It's kind of difficult maybe, but you can see the fruit and bites sticking straight up. So that's a, a real picture or a horizontal picture. Uh, so for each clone, we identify if it can or cannot fruit, and then identify, we design primers for each of the different variants and look with Sanger sequencing to see if the variant is present or not. This included 10 of the 15 variants. I couldn't get um, some of the variants or some of the lines. I couldn't get a clone out of the line that um, was able to fruit, or in other cases, some of them had no fruiting structures at all playing thousands. Uh, but so I got to screen most of a good portion of them. And these are from eight different lines with 166 different clones total. And uh, so this, it was uh, confusing at first, but, and I know it's confusing to look at too, the irony, uh, but what you should focus on is what I want to show you is that um, these with the what we would like to see is if you have a variant in this gene, you've lost your ability to form a fruiting body. If you have the variant and you can still fruit, that disagrees with the idea that this is the problem. If you have, if you can still fruit, or if you've lost the ability to fruit and you don't have a variant. You could have lost it in another way that we, another SNP that we didn't find or anything. So um, the only thing that really goes against this idea is if we see um, fruiting in uh, teens that are still, that have the variant. So despite the variant, they can still form a fruiting structure. And ultimately what we see is that only on this, this is the five prime region, which is where extracellular domain is, that's the only place we found a significant association between variants and um, the phenotype. It seemed on this end, basically, it didn't matter if you had a variant or not, about equal numbers actually formed the fruiting body and did not form the fruiting body regardless. So, yeah, not sure what to do with that. It's only the five prime end that seems to break the protein and is associated with the loss of fruiting. And so we still don't know what the ligand is. Um, there has been work that has implicated GRLG as a receptor of folate. And so it may bind folate, um, but it's not required for the response. So usually DICTI um, uses folate as a chemosensing uh, molecule to um, locate and phagocytose bacteria. So it's a, it's a, it was a long sought after receptor to identify, um, but it's not required. So if it is binding folate, we don't know what it's doing. Um, however, between cyclic A and P and folate, these are the two main chemoattractants that DICTI uses in both stages of its life cycle in the vegetative stage. It responds and, um, binds to folate for phagocytosis of prey. And during multicellular development, then it's uh, using cyclic AMP for morphogenesis. There is some, uh, there are a few other species outside of Dictyostelium discoidium in, uh, in Dictyostelids that also appear to use folate similar to cyclic AMP as a development molecule. So to be decided or to be, to be learned. Oops. Um, stuck. So we know that, yeah, we know that GRLG was facing strong selection under the conditions of um, low relatedness. Um, and we know that the five prime region of the gene or the protein is associated with the loss of fruiting, but we don't know what the binding, what it's binding yet. 
And um, so, yeah, to be continued. Well, we do know cooperation is hard and communication is key. <laughs> and oh, I finished fast with that. I would like to thank the entire Strassman Lab, Strassman Feller Lab, and Joan and Dave, and um, Jason Walker at MGI, fabulous students, uh, Cinderi and Rinchen, and Debbie Brock, who we're sad has left us. And that's it. I'll take questions. Thank you. Very interesting story. Like, uh, I, I'd like to know how many non floating lines do you have in sequencing? And could you use something like a GWAS approach to identify the SNP that is highly associated with the non floating trait? Um, let's see. So, we, I only sequenced one clone, and in retrospect, it would have been better to have done more clones and less of the populations. Um, so I only had the one clone that was able to fruit uh, in order to compare. So I have the one clone and the ancestor. I don't think I could do GWAS. Um, but I'm forgetting why. I think, yeah, I don't know if I didn't have enough. Yeah, I'm forgetting why, but I, I didn't have the ability to to, to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just a comment on that. I hadn't really thought of it this way, but the experiment you did trying to map the phenotype to the known genotype of GRLG is sort of a GWAS. You're mm -hmm. only you're focusing it on one particular SNP instead of all of them. We didn't have that many other ones anyway, so that those were the important ones. Um, not really a question, but an item I wanted to bring up. Um, I can't go back and test your slides, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. In the sequence, when you showed us the mutations, some of them were stop codons, and I think one or more of those were in the three prime end of the gene that apparently was not associated with not fruiting. So, yeah. so we can apparently have a really uh, kind of disastrous uh, kind of mutation there and still not cause the period of things. So still puzzled about that, I guess. Yeah. I'm still puzzled as well. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I, yeah, I've tried to think if, if there was a way, if it was the, there are some signal peptides. So there, the first like 25, uh, uh, base amino acids are a signal peptide. And I've heard, I've read about some cases where the signal peptide plays a different role or has a different function from the rest of the protein after it's cleaved. And I don't know if that could, if that could change anything. So maybe if any of the, if any of the, the variants broke the protein, but the signal peptide was okay. Maybe, but I would also think that if it was broken, it wouldn't even make it that far through the cell. So I don't know. Are these are these uh, heteromeric complexes, or are they is, is just one polypeptide makes one receptor, or or the multiple peptides and can can they be zero diamonds or whatever? I don't know. I assume just one, but I don't know. So that might explain why some of these work at some point just how they fit into a, a larger complex. Hmm. I'd like to, to hear more about that. No. Yeah. I'm not sure. I had kind of a related thought. I don't know enough about the Dicti system to know, but could there just be other pathways involved in fruiting? Like, is this the, like, the only essential, a very essential 
um, component of forming the fruiting body. Like otherwise you could have potentially something catastrophic or something halfway. Yeah. Against the fruiting. Uh, I mean, I think the, the fruiting pathway is pretty well understood, but I, but I know that there's also a good chance that these receptors have multiple roles. So I don't know if fruiting would be, uh, if there's a different way to, to start the fruiting cascade of uh, signals, but there's certainly evidence of um, the GPCRs binding multiple things. And for instance, the cyclic AMP, which is the uh, the main development cue, there's actually four different receptors. And so each of the receptors has a different affinity for cyclic AMP at different stages in the life cycle. So there could be something like that going on. Um, or if it has, if, you know, maybe it's just, there's enough of the other one that's binding whatever, whatever this is doing, maybe it's got a backup plan and the other protein's fine. So yeah, there's a lot of questions. And this is maybe a more like super casual question, but you did mention it, and it's really slipped away from me as to why. But do you remember like what's the selective background for like kind of extreme AD richness in the genome? Mm -hmm. Why is it so high? Oof. Uh, I don't know that we know. Do we know that? I don't think. I mean, Dave, you, I know we've talked about like maybe. Uh, that theory about a hydrophobic hydrophobic ratchet that a yeah I don't I don't know that's an excellent question. There tends to be an like, even bias in patients, but that's why for any other treatment, you can have a bias left. So we we know that um, nucleotides are signaling lots of different nucleotide signals, but the cyclic AMP, um, very different lineage in uh, in animals is used, or at least in mammals, is used as a platelet attractant. So um, I'm wondering if um, so. I so now you you gave me another one very different lineage. And we know that it attracts platelets in blood clotting. Um, so is there, is there a reason that cyclic AMP is good, not just as a signal, but as an attractant? And are there other examples? Is this just like, it was just too accidental divergent research? I wish I could answer that question. I, I, have, I won't even try. <laughs> I won't make anything up for you. I'm not sure, but yeah. Um, okay. I have a question that is not quite related to what you spoke about today, but you had mentioned that you had some outreach and that you, you had a slide about, I'd love to hear since we have some extra time. Yeah, I'm going to see if I can go backwards now. I was able to just now. So our lab started, yeah. excellent. Our lab started this a few years ago, 2018, 2017. And um, one of the students, I guess, named it Market Fresh Science. So we go to the Far Ferguson Farmer's Market every first Saturday of every month in October through May. And we take a group of students we try to like have a mix of undergraduates and graduates and postdocs, whoever wants to come. And we just take an activity set up booth and just interact with the community. So we usually take like a, a little game that we can play and teach about some concept. So it's a different concept or idea every, every time. And we try to have something so like kids can play, older folks can play, and it's really fun. I mean, uh, you know, it's interesting when you get people talking because they're at the market to shop for food. And then they're like, like oh, they, they want to revisit their high school biology class. And it's cool to get people, you know, thinking about those things and stuff. 
So we are going every Saturday this October through May, but if any of you or your labs want to join us, we would be happy to have help with us, or you could even adopt your own Saturday. We could, I could help you get set up on a different weekend. You could have it all to yourself. And um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking me. I just want to show it that I could go back. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, let's give another hand to Dr. Cocker. Yeah, you have a reception. Um, hopefully, you can just set up now. If not, we can chat um, <laughs> before it'll get set up. But yeah, so just thank you, everyone. Way fast. Please look through it. Thank you. Awesome.